Sengoku Rants aka Rant 7 is the 10th title Parallel Universes in a series of fantasy games made by Aerogay developer company Alisoft. Containing a deep lore, unique characters, and actual gameplay, this title has always been a sort of cult classic for many Aerogay fans. But there's a catch. The main character is a rapist. Okay, the titular Rance is the sort of Aerogay protagonist who, well... Your compliance isn't a factor! Now that isn't all that special in the genre, but surprisingly enough, here it is done in a very parody anime kind of way that makes it more palpable to a less niche audience. Or act as a gateway drug, but anyway, if despite that, you can't handle a series with that sort of protagonist, then sadly I think it's best that you stop here. Though, I think it's worth to note that the world, its lore, and the writing in general is fantastic to the point that in a parallel universe, I'd expect this series to get adapted into an anime series. Yes, in a parallel universe. But we'll come back to that. While the bulk of the series takes place in a landmass called The Continent, a hodgepodge of allegories to real life cultures within a single landmass, Sengoku Rants takes place in an isolated island the universe is equivalent to the Sengoku period of Japan, named Japan. Oh, localization changes? Nippon. Eh, doesn't have the same ring to it. Japan. Here in the land of Nippon, the people have broken out into civil war with various factions vying for dominance. Factions range from grizzled veterans, warmongering warriors, and elite ninjas to clay pots, overgrown raccoons, and a teenage boy who's in way over his head. Centered in the chaos is the Oda clan, currently dealing with a civil war inside the civil war. In comes Rance. Vacationing from the continent in order to bang the country's illustrious princess Kohime, Rance meets up with the leader of the faction, Oda Nobunaga, portrayed here as a well-meaning but sickly young gentleman. Wait. That can't be right. Isn't Nobunaga normally portrayed as a villain because in life the dude actually called himself the Demon King and people just kinda, you know, rolled with it? Weird. Anyway, Rance takes a job commanding the army in place of the sickly Demon King as the not-so-secret secret ruler, which is what caused the civil war inside of the civil war. Rance, for one, takes to this job very quickly. Why? Is it the power? The money? The ability to decide who lives and who dies in this bleak war-torn country? Well. As fun as all that seems, Rance is a man of focus, and he came here for one reason and one reason only. To give Kohime a taste of his lolly- But no matter, there are always more fish in the sea, and the Oda faction seems like a good enough fishing pole so off Rance goes, and may God have mercy on everyone else's souls. Well, virginities, but souls seem more epic. Being set in the land of Nippon, Sengoku Rance, while still connected to the rest of the games, is a solid isolated story without any need for a player to have tried the previous games, and as you would expect from a Japanese title drawing from the Sengoku era, many of its characters are elaborate reinterpretations of historical figures. Shibata Katsui is a lolicon, Tokugawa Ieyashu is a fat tanuki, Hojo Son is a K-pop star, and well, just about everyone else is an anime waifu. God damn right. Even with those unique interpretations of historical figures, they still aren't even nearing the tip of Alisoft's creative decisions. The world of Rance is filled with crazy and absurd things that almost never get explained, to the point that it kind of wraps back around and grounds the series in a way. I mean, you have illnesses cured by sex, enchanted sex opening dungeons. You're God damn right. But most of those are within the other games. Here, you got Power Ranger Ninjas, Africa and Japan, Africa and Japan. Also, the obligatory sex-based dungeon where Rance has to speedrun a one-man bukake scene to win a prize. But still, what has to be one of the strangest things treated as mundane is Tanegashima Shigehigo. What the fuck? Is he a demon? No. Yokai? No. What's the difference? No. He is a regular human character in the franchise. Man looks like he's made of Minecraft blocks and people even comment on it, just not with any sort of desire to elaborate on the metaphysical concept of a man who looks like an artist's first step. Special shout out to my favorite musket wielder, Yuzuhara Yuzumi, who literally had to grow up with the man. Bruh, bruh. 
Ixne on the musket day. What do you mean? Oh. That's a perfect segue into the, uh, 10 year elephant in the room. I've previously reviewed this game quite a while ago in a now removed video. With his initial plan shot to hell, he agrees over a few drinks to work for Oda and help them survive the turbulent times as long as he is able to screw any workers, captured soldiers, maids, carpenters, mikos, priests, knights, mages, demons, guys. Oh my god, you could grind meat on this. Ah! But with the partnership between Alsoft and Manga Gamer, I told myself I'd re-review this title if it ever got officially localized. And after a long wait, We got it. What did it cost? Now sadly that means all of the memorable stuff older players have grown to adore have been removed. Aw, it's not called Special Cannon anymore. Dude, it wasn't a cannon in the first place. It's a gun. That's what makes it special. <clears throat> now sadly, that means all of the memorable stuff older players have grown to adore have been removed. But compared to the fan translation, there have been many improvements. The presentation of the game's user interface is top notch, going beyond simply updating the translation itself. The game doesn't need to have a separate font installed. There are no names randomly left in kanji. The units are even color coordinated now, though this translation isn't without its, uh, selection of mistakes. The most interesting part, though, was seeing the dialogue and scenes written by another translator. And while I won't lie, it's weird hearing the characters use slang like dude or. Well, metaphorically speaking, as the game is completely unvoiced so you don't hear anyone. While it is a bit weird, most dialogue just flows in a way the fan translation lacked. And hell, as far as accuracy to the source goes, there's a Kekko Common reference now. Nobody knows my face, but everybody knows my body. Oh yeah, it's Kekko Common from Gona Guy, the girl crazy creator of Cutie Honey. That wasn't in the fan translation. And I have a strong feeling that it wasn't just thrown in there by the localization team. Take that as you will. Kecko Common, only from ADV Films. Sexy. Actual DVD does not contain black bars. Buy the DVD and you can see all the nudity, including lots of boobies and stuff. One element of this localization that I really enjoyed was how some Japanese terminology actually made it into the game. Some of the items, attacks, and even classes have been left in their original language, simply translated as romaji, or Japanese written out in the English alphabet. Even more surprising is the inclusion of honorifics into the game, but it comes with a catch. Only the natives of Nippon use them. This is a great compromise in my mind, since the denizens of Nippon are basically Japanese, and I think that the dialogue should portray that, while most denizens of the continent draw inspiration from aspects of the West. Sure, the average consumer might not understand it, and I'm pretty sure plenty of people might find it cringy, but for someone like me, I'll take what I can get. Now speaking of things consumers might not understand, let's talk about Rants himself. Like I said earlier, Rants isn't for everyone. As the VNDB would put it, he's categorized as a, uh, rapist protagonist. So, oh. I, I don't like that word. And being the main character of the series, you can expect content of that style to be quite plentiful. But unlike a Kuro Inu or Taiman in Asagi, how'd I forget that one? The Rant series is more about black comedy rather than sadistic pleasure. I think the best way to describe it would be comparing it to the fatalities of Mortal Kombat. Sure, there are a few that make your spine tingle in all the wrong ways, but most of them are so outrageous and over the top that they don't offend that many people. I mean, just listen to this. Amazing track, indicative of a wonderful OSD. Also the music of 90% of the 8 scenes in the game. Yeah. Now there are some much darker scenes in the franchise, including Sengoku, but they are almost all exclusive to the actual villains of the story. Those scenes are handled much more seriously, which creates a contrast to Rance's more cartoonishly selfish antics. So if you're expecting some sort of woman-hating protagonist just out there to get revenge on those who spurned him, yeah no. Rance is just out here being Rance, and damn the consequences. 
A little bit extra about the main story, the plot of Sengoku Rants is a tale of conquest, deceit, and unlikely heroism spread throughout all the factions involved. Everyone has their own reason for being a part of this war, and while I won't say the game goes super deep on every faction's motivation, each one gets their time in the limelight to provide the player plenty of interesting stories, some comedic, some dead serious. Ultimately though, they are all side stories and obstacles for Rance, his slave Sil, his new ninja friend Suzume, his jailbait weight Princess Ko, and 3G, can't forget about him, to fight through as they take on a quest that will have them traveling and conquering all of Japan. I mean Nippon. Sengoku Rants is primarily a RPG visual novel light strategy game. Mmm, word salad. Where your goal is to screw all of Japan. I mean take over all of Nippon, dammit. Now this ain't no total Rome or civilization. If you want some sort of porn-based deep grand strategy, I'm pretty sure there's no game on the market at the moment. Unless. As far as strategy games go, it has some of the generic things you'd expect. Managing the troops, developing your territory, and most obviously, expanding. But. Many other aspects of a strategy game like building structures are location specific, and each one consumes one of two action flags you get per turn. This isn't all bad though, as while a hardcore strategy game might simply build something and give you a stat bonus, maybe even throw in a notification, Senko Kurens takes full advantage of its visual novel nature, giving almost every event its own little story. You're not just building that foot soldier training camp, you're watching a scene where Kohime is cheering on the idea of having strong soldiers, while Rance is off in his own little world going, Behind this light strategy game is an RPG combat system that again isn't all that complex, but underneath its simple exterior holds a surprising amount of depth. Combat is 6v6, up to 6 of your units against 6 of theirs, if they have them. Both sides set up their units with a front line that soaks and deals damage, and a back line safe from melee attacks while being free to rain hell until the front line is destroyed. Gotcha, bitch. Once on the field, units fight it out, one action at a time, until 25 turns have passed, the sun has set, and both sides' parents demand they come home for dinner, with the victor being determined by either total annihilation, or by which side has more battle rating, a reverse tug of war, affected by dealing and receiving damage. But that's just the surface mechanics. Let's go deeper. Each commander you recruit has a set of stats going from 0 to 9, with 0 being irrelevant and 9 being godlike. Well, except for the last few stats, but we'll go over those later. Starting with moves, this stat is unique in that it only caps out at 6, but also determines how many actions a unit can take in battle. Attack and defense are pretty self-explanatory, how much damage you deal and receive. Intelligence is the most overloaded stat in the game, governing the magic version of attack and defense, but also affecting a lot of smaller things in combat, like getting buffs and healing. Finally, speed, as one would expect, controls how quickly units can get to their action, which can be very important as while 25 turns might sound big, with up to 12 units out on the field, odds are some troops won't have enough time to use them. Outside of the core stats, there's also the stat of troop count, because a commander is nothing without his troops. The troop stat is a mix of HP and stamina, representing how much damage your unit can take, but also affecting how much damage they deal. Sometimes a wounded unit is more of a hindrance than a dead one, since they can't contribute to the battle anymore, but still consume a turn. So those are the stats involved in the game. But let's go even deeper. Every commander's actions are determined by their class, and each class type has a branching skill tree that can be improved throughout the game. Each class has a dedicated role, samurai and archers are your dedicated melee and range units, while foot soldiers are tanks capable of redirecting attacks from allies to themselves, and tacticians are able to give random sets of buffs to allies or cleanse buffs from enemies. A cool aspect of the commanders in the game is that while units of the same class have identical sets of branching upgrades, their starting points can differ. Some units start higher up on the tree, making them more powerful, while others start at the bottom, making them more customizable. Okay, so that just about covers all the aspects of combat, but we can go deeper. I'm kidding, but there is one thing I want to add before moving on. Cinco Garantz is not good at explaining how mechanics work, especially tactician buffs, or buffs in general. These little arrows are not something to be trifled with, because here, buffs are potent, like 50% damage buff potent. With that said, there isn't a good way of knowing how much a unit's stats have been buffed, but just assume the chick who got the red arrow just got a Zenkai boost and react accordingly. Back to the map, we can talk about those last couple of stats, starting with cost. Commanders in your army all have a cost associated with them that can't ever outpace another stat called national power. 
National power is a stat attached to each piece of land in the game, so the main method of obtaining more national power is simply by conquering territories. The last couple of stats, Construction, Search, and Negotiation, are pretty self-explanatory, being the stats used when trying to do events that involve building things or finding things, though Negotiation does have a pretty pivotal role compared to the rest. Starting wars requires negotiation. Yes, you can't just randomly attack another faction, no that would be barbaric. So instead, you must send a cordial declaration of war that might cost 20 negotiation points. Or just wait for Rance to do something stupid and save you the action flag. Now let's talk about factions. While I covered them a bit in the previous section, all the factions in the game are interesting and unique in their own way with their own theme of troops and style of combat. Each one has a sort of mini story inside of the grand tale of Sengoku Rance that you proceed through as you battle for their territories and their women. Take Hojo for example, pretty boy and his band of, what are they called now? Diviners shows up pretty early into the game, constantly battling the formidable Takeda House and their trusty steeds, the Hot Wings. They also seal ogres all across Japan, which can lead to the most random and infamous screenshot from the fan translation. It will always live on in my heart! The Hojo plot also focuses on their leader Sones' desire to save his girlfriend from a gruesome fate, and then Rance fucks everything up. Other houses, like Tokugawa, aren't nearly as ambitious, thinking, you know what, I'm pretty much immortal, I'll just wait for the humans to kill themselves and then profit, and then Rance fucks everything up. The best part about these factions is that they don't just feel like isolated stages in a game, between turns they build up their troops, they have interactions with other factions, it makes the world feel that much more alive, and while the main story of each faction is somewhat linear, as you would expect from a visual novel, most factions have branches to their event chains that can sometimes result in different outcomes. Sometimes these branches require having different characters in your army, and that's where the waifus come into play. As you do battle with various factions, you will occasionally capture one of their commanders and place them into your prison. From there, you can recruit them with, you guessed it, negotiation. This is the primary method of building your army, but that's not their only purpose. While generic commanders are mostly faceless units, much like the factions themselves, unique commanders all have their own little stories, and by talking to them, fighting with them, activating their events on the map, and doing some more complex things, you can build your relationship with them. Doing so will unlock 8 scenes, though with some exception most characters only have 1 CG. Yeah, character could have used a couple more CGs. Jump! I'm jump! I'm jump! I'm jump! But consider this. There are a ton of unique commanders in the game, resulting in a whopping 104 count CG gallery. And hey, for the more bookish types, some characters have more scenes that simply use the same CG as a guideline to their events. Obviously, this isn't the only way to get 8 scenes in the game. This ain't no dating sim, this is a conquest game. You can get scenes by taking over areas, exploring unique locations, progressing in the main story, fighting with certain commanders, hell, you can even tax your citizens for sex, screwing them over almost as badly as most states do in real life. Almost everything you do will lead to, at some point, age content. And unlike some age games, it's not just a reward in itself, the game is built around it with the satisfaction system. This little counter at the bottom of the screen increases every time Rance engages in the horizontal tango, and every 10 points allows you to choose a bonus that will help you in the game, including the ability to call for reinforcements from key characters from previous Rance games. And if you find yourself almost breaking the next 10 point requirement, but just not there with no 8 scenes in sight, you can always just spend some time in Rance's harem. Yes, if you just felt like the game has hit a lull in H content, you have a button for instant H. I guess since I'm talking about the 8 scenes, I should critique them, and well, most scenes tend to be only one image paired with text, with maybe a, um, white paint alternate near the end, but as far as writing goes, it pretty much falls into what I said before. These scenes are much more comedic than one would expect from a non-con protagonist. You know the writing isn't taking anything seriously when the direct response to Rance popping a girl's cherry while pointing out that it's not painful for men is no fair. There is one other way to get age content that I didn't mention though. Dungeons. Most dungeons are, uh, how to put this? Not all that fun. They aren't terrible or anything, but they are essentially a stripped down version of commander battles that repeats until you reach the bottom, and when I say repeat, I mean some dungeons last 10 to 15 floors. And what's your reward for doing these dungeons? Oni bones. And what do oni bones do? Well, they are a secondary currency that is used to get items from the Plupet shop. But dungeons never seem to give enough of them unless you grind them. 
The oddest thing about this though is that unlike almost every other part of the game, the shop doesn't directly contribute to getting any age content. It indirectly contributes by having items used for clearing characters, but that's about it. The rest are just gameplay items, and in the grand scheme of things, they aren't even all that powerful. A far cry from the previous game shop where you could buy an OP mecha waifu powered by… milk. My greatest criticism though has to go to one of the main methods of dealing with the enemy factions. One that I haven't mentioned in this review yet. Vasling, because negotiating trade agreements is exactly what I want to do in my Genghis Khan simulator. I guess you could see it as the good guy option in the game, since while rants may be well rants, the game does leave some events up to the player. Even as a good guy option though, it pales in comparison to the benefits of conquering the faction normally. At best it gives you some national power, a weak reinforcement in battle, and credit where credit is due, a wall to prevent enemy factions from attacking, but contrast that to, uh, I'm just spitballing here, getting almost all those benefits as well as discovering a princess tied in a dungeon, aging her, releasing her in that order, getting a satisfaction bonus, finding her in the wild a few turns later, recruiting her as a powerful foot soldier unit, and eventually clearing her for yet another satisfaction bonus, there's no comparison. The worst thing though is that after the initial vassaling, most factions essentially disappear from the game with no unique events. Or was he never? Even Home Alone Total War over there doesn't have any events related to being a vassal, and he's one of the few factions I felt bad about fighting. Despite these two aspects of the game, I still think Single Grants is a finely crafted experience, if not a bit too easy to play. Now let's move on to my final thoughts. But wait! There's more! Replayability. You know, that term gets thrown around a lot in video games, but what does it mean? Most of the time, restarting the game with your old items? Unlocking the true ending of a game that is mostly the same? Well, not in single grants, because the first playthrough? Well, that's the tutorial level. The real game starts here. Once you beat the game the first time, this unlocks STAR difficulty. These new challenge modes add a much needed difficulty boost to the game, ranging from what the game should have been to These options change enemy troop counts, the amount of attacks they do to you, and the amount of turns you have in a run. Oh, I uh, forgot to talk about the turns. Well, they aren't all that important, because you can hit zero and continue playing, there's no time limit on beating the game, but by ending a run with points remaining, you bank that score, and you can use it to unlock bonuses for future runs, like unlocking characters and recruiting allies. Regardless of what difficulty you choose after your first playthrough, the game remixes itself into its true form, adding events, moving others around, and even allowing players some new unique options that weren't available in the first playthrough. This also opens up new extra routes with different main heroines for completely different stories to play, and you can check out what things you have done across all your playthroughs with the extra in-game report option. It even works underwater! I think we're done here. Sengoku Rants 1010, best game of the year. I honestly don't know what you were expecting me to say. Wait, isn't there someone who's supposed to keep my bias in the check here? Bias check broke. Understandable. Okay, serious mode. Sengoku Rants is an excellent arrow game, honestly top of its class in both gameplay and adult content, even compared to previous entries in the Rants franchise, mainly due to the satisfaction gauge. This one tiny part adds so much to the formula, merging the etchy lover's desire for pixels on the screen with the gamer's desire for numbers on paper. Content is also spaced out extremely well with a world that completely justifies everything being sexy over the top, but the developers still showing restraint. There aren't any battlefields that have gratuitous nudity in the background to distract you or intrusive cut-ins that might yank you out of the game, but at the same time, there is an abundance of adult content in just the right places so you don't feel like you're being drowned in safe work gameplay when you just want to see a titty. The dungeon and vassal mechanics might have been underdone in my mind, but the biggest criticism I can think of for this title is just that I wanted more, and that's the greatest criticism a game can get. I wanted more time to spend with these characters, I wanted more scenes where they interacted with each other, more factions to fight, more CGs to acquire. Yes I'm being greedy with 20 to 25 hours in just my first playthrough, but if anything I think the framework that Sengoku creates, the idea of fighting all of Japan to conquer the waifus at the end of each faction, 
and might be one of the best styles of game for any arrow game lover who also enjoys video games. Not visual novels, but interactive, challenging video games. And it's all led by a comedically villainous yet anti-hero protagonist by the name of Rance. So with all that said, I give Sengoku Rance by Alisoff for the price of $34.95 a steel plus. The way I see it, any arrow game lover who enjoys actual gameplay, this is a must have unless you can't stomach the protagonist. Sengoku Rance was originally released in Japan in 2006, yet even in 2019, I still haven't found a game that has truly bested. Alsoft truly created a landmark title in the arrow game space with this one, and I can't wait to see what's next in the Rant series. Though keep in mind, each game tends to be quite different from the previous entry. Good end up with another 5D. With that said, I'll see you guys next time. Yeah.